Well, hello, New Life Church. I want to welcome you to our worship time this week, to the message that we have. Um, Last September, a few months ago, Andrew and I drove to Chicago for a Minnesota Twins game. And after that, we drove through eastern Wisconsin and visited the farm where my dad had lived from about second grade through eighth grade. We also stopped at a cemetery where about 40 of the 300 or so gravestones actually had the last name Berg on them, spelled B-U-R-G, just like ours. I finally felt what it must be like to be a Johnson or an Olson or a Jacobson. I was in the, I was in the majority, um, or it seemed like I was at least. My great-grandfather is buried in that cemetery near a little village called Pipe. And after returning home, I discovered online that my great-grandpa, Berg, um, actually had owned the farm that my dad had lived on during those middle elementary to middle school years. Um, And it looks like it was excellent farmland. Um, But the discovery that most intrigued me is that that at the time when Grandpa Berg um, was born, so my dad's dad, when he was born, um, that farm included close to 2,000 feet of beautiful lakefront on the eastern shores of Lake Winnebago. When great-grandpa died, he left behind some pretty valuable land ownings. Today, the the worth of that property would be well over a million dollars. But I think he left virtually nothing of spiritual value behind. Because my dad told me for, has told me for years that my grandpa Berg uh, really didn't have any element of faith in his life until he was about 40 years old, and that's when he found Jesus, or rather Jesus found him. And his life was changed. Unlike my great-grandpa, my grandpa was not so successful as a farmer. Dad remembered him farming for about 120 acres in a different location of the state of Wisconsin. He had his own Berg Dairy at the time. He sold ice cream, Dad remembers, and he actually sold gasoline at a little drive-off stop on a major highway going out from the city where they lived fairly close to. But after some costly decisions, it appears that Grandpa Berg ended up losing it all and lived in a very modest home in his retirement years, making hand gloves in a factory until the day that he died. He left almost nothing of value to his children or to his grandchildren. But his spiritual heritage is invaluable. Most of his grandchildren and great-grandchildren follow Jesus faithfully. Not all of them, but most. The world would probably judge my great-grandpa to be reasonably successful, while my grandpa would be considered actually quite a failure, at least in business. But my, great, but my grandpa Berg is my hero. He truly was very rich when he was died, not in monetary terms, but in spiritual terms. He was, as far as I'm concerned, he was a really great ancestor, who I can't wait to meet in heaven someday, because he died about five years before I was born. Two weeks ago, here at New Life, we considered the wisdom of remembering where we have been. And at the end of my message, uh, here at the church at least, our capital campaign chairperson, Beth Leaf, um, shared with us some of the God stops, some of the some of the ways that we've been able to see the fingerprints of God in our lives, in the life of our church here over the past 18 months to two years and even beyond that. Last week, we considered not our past, but we considered our present situation. How we find ourselves in a time and in a place where people are polarized and needing now, perhaps more than ever, A community of faith, a community of grace, hopefully like ours, that seeks first to love and to serve rather than to condemn or to defend ourselves. Today and next week, we're actually going to be considering the future. and I've landed on a question um, for you to ponder with me, and that is this. Are we becoming good ancestors? Are we busy in a way where we are becoming good ancestors for those who are going to follow after us. I say that individually. I can be a little bit obsessed about that. Um, I think of it quite frequently. Um, But also, not just individually, but also corporately. As a church, will will future generations of Aitkenites rise up and call us blessed for the legacy that we are wanting to build in our community? 
Paul the Apostle wrote some challenging thoughts about our attitudes towards our attitude towards the future in Philippians chapter 3. He starts the chapter by listing his credentials. He talks about the tribe that he was born into. He talks about um, his rise and his status as a Pharisee. He actually calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. That would be like a Minnesotan of Minnesotans. But humbly, when he gets to verse 8 in chapter 3, he actually looks back at all that he focused on in those adult years before Jesus encountered him, and he compares his Jewish credentials and achievements from those years with garbage, with the word could literally mean dung. Then he sets his sights on what he wants to be about in his remaining years. And we pick that up today in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, where this is what Paul says in verses that might be somewhat familiar to you. He says this, Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and training toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. That too God will reveal to you in the future. The word is literally the word apocalypse. All right? It means a revealing. Verse 16, only let us live up to what we have already obtained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern that we gave to you. So, so Paul isn't explicitly focusing on becoming good ancestors, but he's clearly turning his attention to the future. Um, and he is actually quite conscious that he is being watched as their spiritual forefather, as their spiritual ancestor. He did say, after all, follow my example. Look to my example and follow it. Follow in my tracks. That's what good ancestors do. I think then that this would be a good, maybe fair first principle for us to get from these verses, or at least one that stuck out to me a little bit that I want to share with you, and that is this. Good ancestors humbly acknowledge that we always have room to grow and that we need to grow. Verse 12, he says, I haven't already achieved um, perfection. I am pressing on. I am leaning in. The word press on literally means to run quickly in order to catch up with someone who is ahead of you. I imagine Paul is talking about trying to catch up with Jesus. And the word for take hold of actually means to grab onto something forcefully, to to grip it tenaciously, perhaps. The message paraphrase of these verses says, reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. The idea that I can picture is somebody who is trying to rescue somebody out of the water and leaning over from a boat and reaching down to them, not only grabbing their forearm, but also having the forearm reach up and grab theirs and together being pulled out of the water. The people from whose lives we have gainfully learned the most will almost always be people who have pressed in further in their development and in their growth, whether in business or in education or whether in the medical field or many other different slices of our culture, great predecessors, great mentors, great ancestors, if you will, lean in on personal growth and progress so that those following after them will do the same thing. Now, we all know the value of continuing education. You've heard that word for years. Um, it applies to people in the fields of medicine or teaching, counseling, technology. It is why a 55-year-old surgeon can embark on learning robotic surgery for the very first time during his career when a different form of surgery has served him well for 25 years. And it's why mechanics several years ago needed to learn about fuel-injected motors rather than being satisfied with the expertise that they had gained on carburetors. One was a thing of the past. They needed to move ahead into the future. And the future meant change. The future meant growth. The future meant catching up, running, to grab onto those that were moving into the future. The same principle is always true spiritually. In the spiritual world, the more intentionally that we choose proactive growth, 
the more that others stand to benefit from the progress that we will end up making. The closer we can draw them to Jesus then, who is reaching out to them just like he has been reaching out to us. So when Paul comes to the end of those six verses that I read, in verse 17, um, and says that we should follow his example, the question I would ask to you today would be this. Would Jesus look at your life and say that you, like Paul, were running swiftly to keep up with him and to grab hold of his hand? Are you lagging behind? Are you just kind of wandering on your own? Walking closely with Jesus is what he expects of us. Walking with him as he accelerates, perhaps. Always learning more, always growing deeper, still choosing to take another step of faith. Are you? There's another principle that's inferred in these verses, and that is this. Good ancestors let go of useless baggage. Good ancestors let go of the stuff that they should not be carrying along with them on this spiritual journey that we find ourselves in our lives. When Paul says that he hasn't already been made perfect, he is implying that there is still a fair amount of imperfection that is within him, all right? There is still sin that needs to be disposed of, discarded, left behind. And I think for Paul, based on some of the... uh, He was a pretty intense man. Uh, I have a feeling that there was periodically some residue in relationships. We know about the residue in the relationship with John Mark. Um, So I think bitterness and unforgiveness were probably periodic battles for Paul, as certainly were numerous other sins. He was not a perfect saint, just like none of us are. Three years ago, after my dad died, we needed to move mom into a care facility, and we faced the task of cleaning out the house, prepping it, renovating a little bit of it, and getting it ready for it to eventually sell. Mom was always an immaculate housekeeper, but while everything always was in a proper place, it was interesting to, to us how much they had squirreled away over the years. We sorted what through what we felt we would want to save or what should be offered to the brothers or to mom and dad's grandchildren and what needed to go into, and that needed to be separated out from stuff that needed to go to um, the Goodwill store and then other stuff that just needed to go into the landfill. And we put that stuff into Randy's trailer. He has quite a long trailer, trailer my brother does, and it was mounded full of stuff. Surprised me how much stuff that we actually had to just throw away. There was zero value left in so much of it. So that might be what Paul is talking about here. Don't go hauling along that trailer filled with a bunch of spiritual baggage. Here's what it might look like spiritually. A childhood friend of mine grew up in a home where his dad was spiritually stagnant, um, and, and his mother repeatedly chose bitterness and unforgiveness, and it oozed out periodically when she was around other people in our church. He observed, my, my friend observed all of us through his childhood and, and never seemed to take the steps needed to be able to break free of it. When I last saw him several years ago, um, during our time together, he revisited an offense uh, of mine that I had actually apologized for years earlier and had apologized sincerely. I was in the wrong. Um, and, and during the conversation that we had, he was also just fixated on what I would call spiritual minutia, all right? Just not important stuff related to God's word, at least from my perspective. With parents who were decidedly not good ancestors, he's been saddled with a spiritual trailer full of useless garbage that follows him around everywhere and has imprinted itself deeply on his heart and on his spirit in a way that only through a miraculous intervention um, from the Holy Spirit do I see him being saved out of that and made new once again. He's got this spiritual trailer behind him filled with stuff that has followed him for years. Like people in every church. Like the children of people in every church. In the grand scheme of things, on the timeline of our lives, there can be so precious little that will be deemed worthy of our emphasis and our attention. 
good ancestors minimize the wasted time and effort and resources that get spent on things that will never endure. We're actually going to follow back on some of that just in a little bit here. Um, so good ancestors forget what is behind and they strain toward what is ahead. And Paul clarifies the biggest why. Why do they do that? That comes out in verse 14 where he says this, I press on toward the goal to win the prize. For which God has called me heavenward, heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's the why. There's an actual prize to be claimed. And Paul says, that's what I'm focused on. The prize that Christ offers to us. Reconciliation with God and then getting to enjoy him from now until forever. With sin being defeated here on this earth and then sin being eradicated and totally absent from heaven throughout all of eternity. So a little perspective on what Paul writes in this phrase. I press on toward the goal to win the prize. Um, when he uses the word goal, it includes the sense of having a target that you look at and that you examine quite diligently. You don't do it haphazardly. You actually zero in on it. The Greek word is actually skopon, S-K-O-P-O-N. The root word is connected with the idea of skeptical, all right? Someone who seriously mm, pays attention and make sure he is seeing the prize correctly. But guys, and maybe some women as well, we get a different word from the same root, and that is the word scope. Now, I can tolerate a lot of little critters around our, our, our house. Nancy loves to feed the birds. I love to see the squirrels taking advantage of the sunflower seeds that Nancy sets out for the birds. Um, but about a year and a half ago, maybe not quite that long ago, there was an enterprising chipmunk that found his way into our garage and eventually found his way into the housing of my heater fan on our truck. Storing acorns there and freezing me out throughout last winter as I could barely turn on the fan without hearing Arr! the acorns rumbling around in that and wondering what in the world has happened here. Perhaps the chipmunk was wanting to be a good ancestor for grandchildren chipmunks. So what do we do? Well, we set traps out and we relocated some of the chipmunks several miles away from our house and we re relocated other chipmunks to chipmunk heaven, but we didn't get them all. And so recently I asked my son about getting a scope for my 22 because periodically I have missed some of the shots I have taken at those pesky varmints and I still haven't gotten all of them. We see traces of them around still. Why do I want to get a scope? Simply because I want more accurately, I want to, I want to more accurately protect my truck heater. At the Tokyo Olympics last year, there was an interesting thing that took place. Some of you might have seen this. There was a Ukrainian athlete who had won a silver medal in a competition, 10-meter um, rifle shooting competition. And going into one of the final rounds of the 50-meter competition, he was ranked the second in the world and he was fourth. So he was just outside of medal range. And so he came to one of these last rounds where he was going to take his shots, got distracted just a little bit before he, before he took a shot, but focused back on the target took the shot, shot it absolutely perfectly at the wrong target. Unfortunately, when he looked back, instead of looking at the right target, he looked at one that was just off next to it. And instead of fi finishing um, in, the, in metal contention, he ended up totally dropping out of contention because one shot that he didn't scope well enough, one shot that he wasn't skeptical enough, and it cost him dearly. That's the word goal, but the word for prize here is an image of an umpire awarding a prize to the winner. Or actually, um, it can be, uh, it can allude to like a referee who raises the arm of a wrestler who's just won a match. Now back to that Ukrainian athlete. Not only did he not have his hand raised or get a medal put around his neck as the champion, but he got mocked online for it. And and in an interview that he had with a journalist, he actually mocked himself and says, who shoots at someone else's target? Only people like me, he lamented. And I thought about that and I thought, he's not nearly as right as he thinks. So many people, non-Christians and church people alike, are spending their entire lives shooting at the wrong target. Pressing on to win a prize that is meaningless. We're obsessed with making money, obsessed with our careers, obsessed with our hobbies, 
obsessed with sports, obsessed with how our kids are doing in th their sports, obsessed with our goal to make enough money so that we can retire young, and on and on it goes. None of those are focused on Jesus, and none of which will leave behind a lasting legacy. None of which characterize somebody who, in God's eyes, becomes a good spiritual ancestor. People are spending their entire lives building an inheritance like my great-grandfather did, who died wealthy, I think, but spiritually bankrupt. My ancestor who, to my knowledge, left nothing behind of eternal value. Now even the farmland is long gone. His whole life was focused on shooting at the wrong target. Contrast that with my grandpa. Fifty years after my grandpa died, I had the opportunity to, I came in contact with one of his pastors who I've known since I was a teenager. This man at this point in time was in his late 70s. I talked with him a little bit about my grandpa Burke, and he said, oh, I remember your grandpa Burke so well. He was quiet and he was humble, and yet he was a generous man, even though he possessed so very little. Grandpa literally missed every target that this world would use to judge him as a success. But he won the prize because he was shooting at the target that mattered. And so may we think ahead to when our children and our grandchildren, our community's next couple of generations here in Aiken, think ahead to the time when they will consider what we did, what you did, what we did collectively at New Life Church during these years, and will they come to the conclusion that we were good ancestors? Or... Well, they shake their heads and think the way that I think about my great-grandfather. Well, they shake their heads and think they could have blessed our community, but they didn't. They were focused just on their own selves and on things that didn't last. They could have built faith into the lives of the next generation. They didn't. They didn't strengthen families. They didn't strengthen their families near as much as they needed to. They didn't strengthen the families of anybody else in our community. They were really, really good at shooting but they shot repeatedly at the wrong target and never figured it out. May that never be the conclusion that people come to regarding our individual lives or the existence of New Life Church. Let's pray. Oh God, like Paul, I want to press on toward the goal to win the prize. Being skeptical of making sure that I'm not focused on something that's wrong, but keeping my eyes on the right target. Not obsessing over things in this life that so many people, including so many Christ followers, obsess with. How we can make more money, how we can retire early, and the, the list goes on and on and on, rather than being just consumed with this thought of, oh, we want to be shooting God at the right target. May that be our passion, may that be our heart's desire, so that we become the good ancestors that you want us to become, so that the next generations after us, God, would look at us and say, they invested their lives well. They built up their own faith and the faith of others around them. They built families within the church and outside of the church. They built community relationships within the church, and they built up this community of Aiken that we are a part of, and we rise up and call those people blessed for how they blessed us. May that be our passion for now and for the years to come as we look to the future and plan for it and build it. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. May God bless you. Have a wonderful week.